good to see all of you here gathered in God's house. And tonight we'll follow the order of service that's printed for us. You received it on the way in. And we're following the common service with Holy Communion, which is also a wonderful joy and treat, a reminder of sins forgiven in Christ Jesus. Our sermon tonight is focused on our Old Testament lesson from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 5. And we'll, we'll talk about the vineyard of the Lord and what that is and what it means and, and how that all relates to our lives as Christians and that as we live that out, that Christian life out in, in our words and actions. Looking forward to sharing more about that uh, later on in the service. But we'll start with, with the first page uh, below the common service. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us, and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your bountiful goodness, keep us safe from every evil of body and soul. Make us ready with cheerful hearts to do whatever pleases you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our appointed lessons for today are found in the insert that you should have received in your, your bulletin. Uh, we'll start with our Old Testament lesson, Isaiah chapter 5, it's found, and it's the basis for this evening's sermon. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. This is the word of our God. Our second lesson comes from Philippians chapter 3 and starts with verse 12. The Apostle Paul writes, Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, 
forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us, then, who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For, as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. This, too, is the word of our God. If you're able, I invite you now to please stand for the reading of the Gospel in honor of the words and works of our Savior Jesus. The Gospel according to Matthew chapter 21. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants, who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. This is the word of our God, and the gospel of our Lord. We'll now join together to confess our Christian faith, and tonight we'll use the words of the Nicene Creed printed out for us to do that. Confess with me. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten by name, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified in the conscious power. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. 
and to his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Recently, a lot of our, our lessons that, that we're doing in church are about vineyards. And I really honestly thought to myself, well, planting and organizing a vineyard can't be that hard. Until it is that I got to Googling it and looking through all of those, those things that you need to consider in order to plan and plant a vineyard got me a little overwhelmed. You need the right kind of land, you, you need dedication, you, you need to, to dedicate yourself to this thing, this vineyard. Leisure time will probably go out the window. You need to weekly attend to those vines, weekly during the harvest season. You have to do some pruning during the winter. You, you have to make sure everything is set and just so, so that the product that comes out it is worthwhile and is beneficial for the thing that you're growing these vines for in the first place. And so after all of that, I decided, no, I don't think a vineyard is in my future. And that's fine, and, and that's okay, I can do other things. But the man in our lesson for tonight, from Isaiah chapter 5, he had this dedication about him. He was going to make sure that, that this vineyard of his was planned and, and planted. We, we can see his dedication to his vineyard. Our, our lesson, it starts this way. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and, and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He, he built a watchtower in it and, and cut out a wine press as well. Unbeknownst to me, but I guess vines, they grow well on slopes. These vines grow there like nothing else does. And there's even more sunlight, that the drainage is better. And this man chooses a fertile hillside, like the perfect place for his vineyard. And not only that, he digs up the soil, he prepares it for planting, he goes through that, that struggle, that hard work of, of clearing all of the stones in his way. He puts a watchtower in it so that it's protected from, from robbers, from wild animals that might come in and destroy those choice vines. Not, not just any vines, not just any old vines, but the choice vines. And then he cuts out a wine press. He cuts this out of the bedrock. I also imagine not an easy task either, but, but one that was laborsome, toilsome, took many hours, but that's what he did. All for this vineyard of his. Also, it could bear crop, so he could be prosperous. And of course, there was something that, that you needed to put this product in, maybe wineskins, you needed workers to work in this vineyard. But, but then there's a shift in our lesson, a, a subtle shift from what this vineyard owner did for his vineyard to his expectations of his vineyard. And our lesson goes on, it says, Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. His expectations weren't too high. It wasn't out of the ordinary or asking too much for these choice vines to produce good grapes. 
But instead, instead of those good grapes, he, he literally got grapes that were rotten, or sometimes translated stinking. Maybe worthless is the right word. So he puts in all of this work and in all of this effort only to have rotting, stinking grapes. And so was it the owner's fault? Or, or was the vineyard itself at fault? Was, was it not actually as fertile as he thought it would be? But then our lesson says this. It, it, it gives us a, a question to consider. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? So these questions, they, they assume an answer. But then the context, it, it tells us that there's not really any answer at all. Because this vineyard owner, absolutely, he did all he could. Everything in his might and power to make this vineyard prosper. Only to find bad fruit worthless fruit for his effort. And so since this vineyard didn't do what it was supposed to do, we're announced the judgment that the owner had on it. We're, we're told that his plans for this vineyard. He says, now I will tell you what I'm going to do. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds, not the rain on it. It's almost like, like he's having a conversation with the vineyard. Okay, vineyard, you're not going to produce good grapes? I'll see about you. I'll take away your hedge. I'll take away your wall. You're going to be a wasteland, not a vineyard. Things will grow in you, but they're not going to be that great. Briars and, and thorns. And also, by the way, I'm going to command the clouds and the rain to stay away from you. You're going to be desolate. That judgment on this vineyard, it was, it was fair, wasn't it? Right? The vineyard, this unproductive vineyard, got what it was coming to, right? If you're going to be unproductive, well, then you're not going to be a vineyard anymore. You're going to be destroyed. We, we've heard the lesson already, but the original audience hearing this lesson really, really didn't know what was going to happen yet. They, they didn't have the advantage of, of hearing already verse 7, where, where we find out what's really happening in this lesson and, and who we're really dealing with. Verse 7 says, The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel. And the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. And because of this revelation, we, we see this lesson in, in a new light. We, we see that God's people, Israel, has not fulfilled God's expectations for them. He looked into the hearts of his people, and God wasn't expecting what he would find. He looked for righteousness and justice, but only bloodshed, only cries of distress. And you would think that, that God's people would show their love and appreciation for him, for, for everything that, that he had done for them. But that's not what he finds. He sees bloodshed. He, he hears the cries of distress from the people that God's people had oppressed. Isaiah, in, in this lesson, clearly issues a, a call to repentance to God's people. But, but there is still time. There's still time to change behavior and, and change this, this mindset of theirs. But it is clear that, that God does care for his people. For the house of Israel and for the people of, of Judah, God adopted them into his family. He, he delivered them out of slavery in Egypt. He fed them. He, he protected them. 
He led them through the wilderness. He even gave their forefather Abram this promise about the land of Canaan. He says, to your offspring, I will give this land. And the Lord kept that promise. Abram's descendants did, in fact, inherit the land of Canaan. Psalm 80 says it this way. You transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it and took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. Its branches reached as far as the sea, it shoots as far as the river. God gave them a system of laws for their good. He gave them his written word, his laws and commands, and its promises, especially the promise of the coming Savior. He gave them this sacrificial system of sacrifices to, to point to the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus, but, but to have that reminder that, that blood needed to be shed for forgiveness. He, he responded in his love to them. He gave them kings to rule over them and, and prophets to bring them God's word and to bring them back to call them back from their sin and toward their God. But yet even after all of that, Jeremiah 2 says, I had planted you like a choice vine of sound and reliable stock. How then did you turn against me into a corrupt wild vine? God is and does act in love to call his people to repentance. It's true that, that Israel had not fulfilled God's demands, but you and I know that we haven't either. The, the fruit that we produce, how often is it rotten and worthless? Maybe there, there's a stench to it, stained with our sin. That, that the things that, that come out, out of our hearts and minds are not always pleasing to God. In fact, they're, they're rotting. They're rotting things. Things that, that remind us of our sinfulness and the decay of sin that's in us. But yet, God calls us His children. He tells us that we are part of His family. He even calls us the garden of His delight. We're told in 1 Corinthians 6, you are not your own, you were bought at a price. And that price was the lifeblood of Jesus Christ, our Savior. God, God has invested in us, hasn't he? he? He has called us to continue to be faithful to him and, and to his word. And he's done so much for us, hasn't he? That, that he sent a Savior in Jesus, he, He's done everything necessary for our salvation. He, he covers us with His righteousness. He, he forgives our sins. He covers the, those rotting and, and stinking sins that we commit. He makes us then pure and, and holy and, and perfect. But somebody might say, well, well what more could God have done? I bet there are some that say, well, God, you, you could have done way more than you have, right? Maybe somebody says, well, you know, God, you could have protected me when I was harmed. God, you, you could have prevented my marriage from collapsing. You could have prevented my child from having that stroke or, or that other child from having leukemia. Why, why didn't you protect me, God? I, I pounded on, on the gate of your heaven with my prayers, yet you, you didn't answer them. God, you're, you're always so quick, right, to be around to tell me what to do, but you're never around when I have something for you to do. We might wonder if God has failed. But our God has not failed. It's you and me that do the failing. When we fail our God with our, our rotten, stinking fruit of sin. Yet we know with confidence that Christ covers that stink. 
How, how does our, our garden grow? Well, well, the Word of God and this comfort in Jesus of, of sins forgiven motivates us. Motivates us to, to good deeds, to fruits of, of faith, the fruits of the Spirit that we can now produce in response to God's love for us. There, there's no motivation out of fear of judgment, but, but we're motivated out of the love God has shown to us. And so he looks at you and me with delight. Our God looks through the lens of Jesus to see you and me as pure and perfect. And it leads Isaiah to be inspired to write this in Isaiah 27. In that day, sing about a fruitful vineyard. I, the Lord, watch over it. I water it continually. I guard it day and night so that no one may harm it. I am not angry. If only there were briars and thorns confronting me, I would march against them in battle. I would set them all on fire. Or else let them come to me for refuge. Let them make peace with me. In days to come, Jacob will take root. Israel will blood and blossom and fill all the world with fruit. You, you and I continue to bear fruit because we've been washed in the waters of baptism. You and I will continue to hunger and thirst for the Lord Jesus and his body and blood in, in the Lord's Supper. We, we know Christ. We, we know that we are in Christ. And because of that, we, we press on in this life. Not, not for an earthly prize, but for the prize of heaven. Our, our heavenly citizenship. Where we can live with our God for all time and forever. And so through all of this, friends, we are truly blessed to be part of the Lord's vineyard. And for this, friends, to God alone, be all glory, honor, and praise. Amen. I'll now invite you to, to join with me uh, to speak the, the words of Create in Me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your free spirit. Amen. We have two special prayer requests this evening before we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the first one will be for uh, Wisconsin Synod's Hispanic Ministry, and the second prayer will be for Ken Ebert. Uh, Ken is currently at St. Mary's Hospital in Rochester, uh, battling digestive issues. We join our hearts now in prayer. Heavenly Father, Thank you for giving our churches in the United States the opportunity to share the gospel with so many people groups. Today we ask you to bless our ministry efforts focused on reaching and serving Hispanic neighbors. Bless our synod's production of Spanish Bible studies, meditations, worship opportunities, and other resources of the Cristo Palabra de Vida, Christ the Word of Life program. According to your gracious will, bring many people to faith in Jesus and lead those who are already Christians to better understand and believe all that Scripture teaches. And Heavenly Father, we entrust into your arms and care your servant, Ken Ebert. Be with him, Lord, as he battles his ongoing digestive issues. We ask you to bless the doctors and nurses that care for him. We ask you to remind him of your presence, of your forgiveness, of your promise of heaven. And we ask you, Lord, if it is your will, for a quick recovery for Ken. Bless him and his family and be with him now and always. All this we pray boldly and confidently in your son Jesus, 
and join together in the prayer he has taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We'll now join together to speak the words of the Song of Simeon on the back page of our bullet. <clears throat> Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. Receive with believing hearts the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn tonight uh, is, is a handout. Uh, did everyone receive one? Everybody's got one? Wonderful. Uh, so we'll sing together uh, those four stanzas listed. Uh, for Speak, O Savior, I am listening.
Uh, I don't have any specific announcements I don't think I, I need to make. But if there's not anything else, uh, God's blessings to you, and I hope to see you again very soon. Thank you.